Leaders of the Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. The lecture series, uh, Professor Ria Huang and Gao Zivili, and also uh, for Edna for um, Edna Wan for coordinating um, this talk behind the scene. And then I'm very honored to be this part of this series, Emerging Feminist Research on Asia. So when I was first approached about this, uh, this series a year ago, I hope to meet you in person um, at McGill, but here we are. So uh, let me uh, share the screen and then um, show the PPT and then proceed. Okay. Um, so uh, like I was introduced, so I, uh, I teach Korean studies at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, so my original training comes from a broader studies of cultural studies. Um, compared to literature and East Asian studies, particularly focusing on colonial Korea and Japanese empire. Um, so this book, so uh, today's presentation is drawn from my recent book. Um, it's out in the print about a year, but I didn't have that many chance to uh, do book talks due to pandemic. So I feel like in a way, so it's been um, very long that I finished, like since I finished this book, but then at the same time, like maybe I should keep talking about this book because it's not that well known. Um, as because like, yeah, I didn't really do much of book talks. So, um, but the, uh, so the introduction to framing. Um, so for today as an opening segment, I actually, uh, I'd like to give a brief background of this book, how it started. So the book is an expansion of my PhD dissertation of the, that was originally titled Romancing Race and Gender, Intermarriage and the Making of the Modern Subjectivity in Colonial Korea, 1910 to 1945, which I filed actually like 2009. The seed of this project started 2003 during my graduate studies years. Um, and then the bulk of the research started 2005. So it's actually been more, uh, it's been a decade, more than a decade to publish this book. Um, I want to say something briefly about why I wanted to write about this colonial literature on intermarriage and romance between Koreans and Japanese. So I found a book chapter actually um, in, uh, from Korea in Korean, uh, the scholarship that was published in early 2000s. And on some, um, the, the chapter um, deals with some colonial era short stories that deals with romantic uh, relationship between Koreans and Japanese. The book chapter was a sh uh, pretty short, so the number of the examples that, um, that the chapter was discussing was pretty limited. So after reading this, um, this piece, I found more examples and some by well-known authors and then some by neglected authors. So then I realized that these works uh, were already known to Korean literature scholars, but never been put together in a book length study. So I started asking some questions to other established uh, Korean literature scholars. Um, and at first, they all seemed to agree these uh, works, these uh, short stories and sometimes novels, they were pretty important, but at the same time, not really worthy of deep, uh, deep and critical analysis. Uh, some, you know, some people I talked to later, they changed their mind and they also published some articles on these works too. Um, so, however, at the time, so I was convinced that these, um, these literature, short stories, and then also other print and visual culture uh, productions that prioritize intimacy of these Korean and Japanese two groups um, had an important critical value in colonial Korean culture. And it is a topic that can bring together questions of race, gender, intimacy, imperialism, and offer a glimpse of what colonized people thought about the living with the imperial other. So in other words, these fictions challenge the expected colonial boundaries, creating tensions in identity and hierarchy, and also it challenged the narratives of the linear developmental trajectory of modernity. So one more question to ask here is that, why was the topic of intimate relationship under Japanese colonialization unacknowledged in the past? Or why did it not receive a proper attention in the academia? So I say there will be like a two levels to explain this phenomenon. 
One is the public discourse and the other is the academic research. So the public uh, in the, the level of the public discourse was that very much uh, kind of buried under the rhetoric of the Cold War nationalism in South Korea. So the Japanese colonialism history was uh, memorialized in negative tones and Japanese colonial government was remembered as an oppressive and a coherent agency. But from the late 90s, slowly, even with the popular culture, started to engage with different aspects of the colonial era, such as modernization, urbanization, women's self-realization, and so forth. But the discussions of intimate relationships were still limited. I wouldn't say this is the entirely because of South Korean nationalism and antagonism towards the Japanese colonial history, or at the time, the revelation of the comfort woman history in the 90s, but combination of things after the 1945 liberation, um, mostly under the, uh, the post-colonial colder um, effect, such an anti uh, um, colder effect, for example, like the anti-communist uh, ideology, the short-term uh, US occupation and the long-term US military presence in Korea, and then um, uh, the camp towns of the US military and the sex work around the US military. Um, these are the various, uh, there are, this, uh, including these, there are various effect, uh, aspects that shape the public and popular discourse. The second layer is about the academic research. The academic discourse was more nuanced, but certainly there were mainstream discourses on the portrayal of oppressor and oppressed but there was some room for a more complex explanation of colonial ex experience. But due to the various discipline constraints, there were very few research on Japanese and Korean intimate relationship before the 90s. More meaningful researches were published from the mid 2000s. And now there are some few important publications from the Korean history discipline. So, Briefly, uh, so briefly summarizing the talk, so that I would like to bring you to the Japanese colonial era of Korean Peninsula, to the beginning of the 20th century. In the in 1905, Korea became the protectorate of Japan, and in 1910, officially it became a colonial territory of growing Japanese Empire. During the Japanese colonial era, intermarriage between um, Koreans and Japanese in Korean Peninsula was both regulated and promoted by the colonial government in various forms. Being geographically close, the Japanese metropolitan government from the beginning encouraged its mainland population to move to Korea and the colonial authorities attempt to convert colonized subjects into Japanese nationals. In Korea, the encouragement of intermarriage as an assimilation strategy appeared fairly early in the development of the Japanese imperialism, but the structural promotion of Korean and Japanese uh, marital union occurred long after the first general assimilation effort in the 1910s. And then beginning in the late 1930s, uh, government General of Korea, the GGK's intermarriage campaign emerged as top-down policy that emphasized the importance of family unit with the aim of making Koreans more royal and reliable imperial subjects. Catchphrases like love conquers all, which were part of the rhetoric that romanticized the Japanese empire, emerged with the GGK's announced, uh, pronounced efforts in support of intermarriage. Some Korean intellectuals agreed on the power of love. One magazine article stated, um, love overcomes national borders, the ethno-nation and classes. Therefore, Korean Japanese marriage does not need our worries. This is from 1940. It certainly seemed that both Koreans and Japanese wanted to believe that the idealized discourse of romance could resolve colonial and racial conflicts. Only Koreans, however, actively adopted the theme of intermarriage into, in, into their literary fictions. 
Um, in effect, the romance narrative became a key way to advocate inter-ethnic mixing, making the assimilation program an effective apparatus in colonial territory, territories. Uh, many well-known authors took the intermarriage and romance theme and uh, fictionalized the life of becoming a Korean and Japanese mixed couple or family or life after their marriage. For the colonial authority, however, it is a complicated question to ask what ex to what extent that the GGK's intermarriage policy was enforced on Koreans, especially when we take a close look at the systematic support, including legal changes and benefits given to intermarried couples and mixed families. My book, Imperial, uh, Imperial Romance, captures this complex phenomenon, analyzing representations of Korean-Japanese intimate relationship, including romance, marriage, and kinship in Korean popular literature, uh, Korean popular literature, media, and cinema, alongside documents that discuss colonial policies during the Japanese protectorate period and the colonial rule in Korea. I argue that the theme of intimate relationship, particularly intermarriage, gave elite writers and the cultural producers opportunities to explore their feelings about becoming proper imperial subjects in different ways from official guidelines. Their fictions complicated the entity of the colonial and imperial subject, creating tensions in identity, imperial hierarchy, and modernization's developmentalist trajectory. I suggest that this imagination, um, imagination was gendered, racialized, and marked by male writers' desire for upward mobility in the prescribed colonial hierarchy. This talk explores the representations of Korean Japanese romance, intermarriage, and family in literary text in the colonial period. For those of you who might be interested in the colonial cinema, I, I'm not talking about this in, the, in this talk, but then I actually have a separate, I had to put uh, uh, together a separate article after I finished my book manuscript, I realized that I couldn't fit everything in the epilogue. So I kind of put um, a separate article about the, um, the, uh, the cinematic representation, the cinema in the uh, intimacy, uh, colonial intimacy in Korean cinema um, from 1940s to 1960s. Okay, so, in particular, I offer some snapshots of how Korean writers understood colonial intimacy. Writers who belonged to the elite and were national opinion readers in different stages of the colonial period. Overall, I examine how a Korean male author imagined this, uh, desire and intimacy, namely through romance and marriage and mixed family with Japanese in the colonial period with some changes over the different time period. I'll talk about three well-known colonial era authors today. The first is an Enlightenment era writer and the national leader, Yin Jik. And the second one is the father figure of the modern Korean literature, Yi Gwang Su. And the third one is the writer, uh, modernist writer, Yi Ho Seok. So I'll try to uh, go over very briefly of these writers um, to give you examples um, of the different time period. Uh, so the background, so um, I'm going into general, explaining the general background. In recent decades, scholars of imperial and colonial studies have conducted exciting research on the role of intimacy and marriage in imperial projects. They have also explored the similarities in the way various empires in different locations were invested in colonial intimacy, that is intimate relationship formed under the colonial conditions. From these studies, it is clear that regulations regarding marriage and family were, critical part, were a critical part of the imperial governance in both European and US imperial uh, colonialism. In the case of the European colonialism, authorities intervened intermarriage after witnessing widespread and visible hybridity in their settler communities, such as mixed race children. So I'm referring to the, um, the studies on the British India and the Southeast Asia, 
Um, so examples of well-known scholars are uh, the works by Ann Stoller and the Durba Bush. In the context of the colonial Korea, Japanese colonial rule started in modern era in the 20th century. The policy on Korean Japanese marriage was imposed as a top-down control throughout the colonial period. What I mean by the top-down control is that Korean Japanese marriage was allowed by the Japanese ruling power through a series of the legal changes. And the second, there was a state-sponsored promotion of intermarriage. In, it is particularly noteworthy that Japanese the Japan systematically sought to turn its colonized Asian subjects into bearers of Japanese identity. This was not an overnight project. Thinking within the assimilation project for the Japanese rulers, the ideology encouraging the hybridity came from a brief that um, the came from a belief that conjugality and the family union could allow Koreans to achieve a model assimilation. So, okay. Um, the idea of intermarriage became institutionalized as part of the wave of kominka, or the, um, the English translation is imperial subjectification, kominka policies from the metropole. The Korean version of kominka is the daesan ilche, or in Japanese, the daisen itai. So the English translation is Japanese, uh, Japan and Korea as one body. This was first promoted during the tenure of Governor General Minamichiro. Um, in this context of the war mobilization, intermarriage crystallized the existing idea of making Koreans more like Japanese while re-emphasizing the importance of the family unit. Ultimately, the goal was to instill a royalty to the Japanese empire that would turn um, Koreans into reliable imperial subjects who could fight and die for Japan. While other desonite policies were significantly coercive and publicly visible, such as the use, use of only the Japanese language and Japanese names in public, um, intermarriage was never forcefully imposed on Koreans. Rather, it was promoted as an ideal. In fact, the GGK's official promotion of intermarriage um, did not mean that we practice uh, that the practice was fully supported by the GGK or that the encouragement of this practice was effective. The amendment process of the law regarding the marriage moved slowly throughout the colonial period that allowed Korean and Japanese to register their marriage in the family registry or the hojak koseki. There were loopholes in the census record that intermarried couples and the lack of counting measures for sexual arrangements, such as temporary cohabitation or concubinage in both Korea and Japan. Even the government officials and national elites in both Korea and Japan voiced their opposition in intermarriage in the news media from time to time, although these were marginal voices. However, at the beginning of the wartime period from the late 1930s, uh, an awareness of the colonial hybridity increased among the authorities when many Korean men voluntarily or involuntarily migrated to Japan and formed various sexual arrangements from legal marriage to temporary cohabitation or occasional prostitution and these media started to circulate census figures on intermarriage. Several newspapers and magazines from 1939 and after published tables on the number of intermarried couples. The numbers was not that high at all and because they were not really captured that well, but the visibility of these census tables as scientific technology to the readers was important in the public discourse. We'd all agree that the literary representation is not the same as the state guideline or propaganda. My observation in uh, colonial fictions about colonial intimacy is that the colonized men often attempted to elevate their positions in the hierarchy of the Japanese empire, not as a secondary subject, 
but to the equal being as the colonized, colonizer, meaning the Japanese men. In this way, I argue that the male writers were not colonized subject in crisis as they are often described in literary scholarship, but active participant and agents of Japanese imperialism and perhaps the global imperialism. And the next, uh, next couple of slides, I wanted to sort of show you the images and the kind of examples that I kind of uh, didn't really talk so far. Um, so the literary and the cinematic images of intermarriage and the mixed family, sometimes they are used for war mobilization purpose. So for example, Um, this is a this is kind of scene um, from the movie 사랑과 맹서 아이 아이 so um, the English trans English translation title is Love and Vow. So from 1945, this is co-directed by uh, one Korean director and then one Japanese director. Um, so you kind of see that um, a in the in this movie the Korean boy. On, uh, who was orphan was adopted by Japanese family couple and then he becomes sort of um, royal reliable Japanese imperial subject who's ready for war mobilization. This is the way uh, the final ending that he goes to the um, voluntary become a voluntary uh, pilot for the Navy for Japanese Empire to participate in the war. But then he was orphaned in Seoul, but then by a couple who's living in Seoul, Japanese settlers, they adopt him, adopted him, and then he now he's becoming a full-fledged imperial citizen from a troubled street kid. And I'm going to skip this. Oh, and then the uh, in my book, I talk more about this case is that how the um, the, uh, the the colonial uh, colony intimacy, the marriage between Koreans and Japanese were legally uh, promoted and then legally they were allowed is that from the beginning of the colonial period, um, the uh, government, uh, Japanese government talked actively about having the Korean prince from the Korean prince Eun from the uh, Joseon dynasty, who is the son of the Kojong king, should marry a Japanese woman. And then he was sent to Japan for education, and then he had this arranged marriage. And then uh, from the, uh, in the 1910s, there were uh, newspaper kind of discussions and about like uh, he he should get um, uh, he should get engaged. And then he was engaged in 1916, and he was uh, finally got married to a Japanese lady, uh, Masako. And then uh, her Korean reading of the, her name is the Pangja. So she, I'm right. Uh, I'm referring to as a princess Pangja um, in the 1920. So this was a Korean newspaper announcing that the Korean the king's descendant is now being married to Japanese woman. Um, so the family dynamic will change forever. Uh, but then this this uh, this photo in the newspaper you can see that the. Uh, Prince Eun is wearing Japanese style Western, but then Japanese style military uh, suit. And then the woman is in the photo, which is separate. Um, she's wearing, she has this Japanese hair and the Japanese style hair and the Japanese style clothes. Of course, but then the wedding photo, this is the kind of gift to the families and the um, to respected families and the people as the announcement of the wedding. There, uh, this. This is called the wedding, the photo quality is much, much better here. But then this was in the Western wedding style. But then the, um, the newspaper announcement to Korean public, it was obviously that there's a contrast of the Korean and Japanese wedding, having wedding. The, another example of the media promotion in the 1910s about the intermarriage is, this is a um, newspaper clip from the Meiji uh, Shinbo from 19, uh, 18, and the title is the home of Japanese and Korean as the same body. So the uh, the promotion of the Nesho Nilche or the Naisen Itai kind of uh, slogan is already a similar type. Its slogan is already being used here. And then this is the case. The explanation of the is the male is Korean and the wife is Japanese, and then so he's very proud of have his home style speaking Japanese, and the child is entirely speaking Japanese, and then they have this Japanese style, culture, 
clothes, food, and house style, everything is Japanese, and he's very happy with his marriage. And then in the corner of this news clip, you can see that despite the fact that we often think like this kind of assimilation rhetoric is that making Jap uh, Korean more into Japanese style, but then how this Korean, uh, meanwhile, the newspaper and the media and the writers, they interpret it as like Korean men marrying Japanese women. Um, so if we have the next one's a bigger picture here, it's, is that the sketch, this is cartoonish sketch is that the, uh, the right hand side is a Korean male uh, because of the attire and the left side is a Japanese female, supposed to be Japanese female. So the clothing styles are different. But then you can see that the Korean man is bigger, taller, and the Japanese woman is slightly shorter. And then the angle, how they hold hand each other is like this, you know, there's a um, this hierarchy that this uh, picture is picture shows. So definitely gendered and racialized hierarchy you can see in the picture. Okay, so I'm going to move into the examples of the literature. Um, I'll try to make the short, uh, try to make sure I make this shorter so we, um, we can fit in the time. So the first one, I wanted to talk about this uh, short story uh, the title, Bin Seolyang Ilmin, or Japanese Beauty of a Poor Korean, that was published in 1912. This is considered as the earliest, the current kind of known um, example of the intermarriage story in modern Korean literature, published, uh, written by the uh, author named Yi Injik. So uh, Yi Injik was actually selected as one of the first state-sponsored students to pursue an education in Japan, and he lived in Tokyo in the early parts of 1900s. And it's rumored that he's actually, he, he married a Japanese woman in, uh, in Japan while he was studying there. And then he, he also brought his wife, Japanese wife to Korea. After he returned to Korea, he became a successful writer, forging a pass, a new pass in the new novel genre, which is called the Shinsosol. And he's actually uh, the Yin Jig is very well known, uh, the pioneer of the Shinsosol writer, genre writer. And then Tears of the Blood on the right hand side, this Tears of Blood is considered as kind of the best well known uh, new fiction writing. And then there's another one, uh, very uh, well-known writing is the Chiaksan or the Mount, Mount Chia, which was published in 1908. But uh, this is a short story, The Tears of Blood and the Chiaksan is a, a rather longer novel, but this is a short story that I want to discuss, um, introduce you briefly is that Injik acts, uh, is a, he, the writer himself is a controversial figure, but his view on Japan and civilization are very clear in the Japanese beauty of a poor Korean, especially in his treatment of the intermarriage. The beautiful Japanese wife, the, this is how the story starts. The beautiful Japanese wife laments her alienation in Seoul or Gyeongseong the, at the time, the name, um, because the, her, lament, uh, her lamentation um, her, sorry, her alienation in Gyeongseong, excuse me, her alienation um, comes from her dire financial status. The story begins with the wife complaining that she's the poorest woman, Japanese woman in the city, and she blames her Korean husband for deceiving her about his wealth to lure her to Korea. The core conflict of the story is that the husband has achieved a certain level of education and social status, which allows him to have a Japanese wife while he's still unable to attain wealth that is equivalent to that of Japanese men in Gyeongseong. Intermarriage here serve as a metaphor for the limits of colonial mobility and Korean men's lack of financial and career opportunities. This story introduced many stereotypes or the uh, very prototypes of Korean Japanese intimate relationship that are repeated in subsequent Korean literature. For instance, the Korean character in such literature is almost always a Japanese educated man, 
elite, uh, uh, often of elite status, while the Japanese character is often female and from a lower class background. They're, uh, they're often from Yugak or the pleasure quarter, and then they worked at bars and cafes. This kind of background provides the reason for her willingness to move to Korea, which, is, which was considered as the dangerous colonial territory. On the other hand, marrying a Japanese woman further complicates the Korean husband's social status in the colonial territory. So the um, second example, I'm jumping to the second example I uh, wanted to talk about is that um, uh, it's Yi Guangsu, the writings from the Yi Guangsu. But then I want these, this uh, next couple of stories will complicate this kind of heteronormative image of the intermarriage um, that I want to present you as like a different example. So one, the Yi Guang uh, Yi Index, this short story about the Japanese wife is a kind of prototype, very common relationship. But at the same time, there were some other uh, short stories. They still really deals with the colonial intimacy between Koreans and Japanese, but then it's kind of deviates from the heteronormative uh, relationship. So in the Yi Guangsu's earlier career, that uh, Yi Guangsu is uh, known as like the founder of the like the father figure of the modern Korean literature because of his uh, novel The Heartless. But then now it is well known fact is that his first publication was actually a short story uh, called the uh, short story written in Japanese about male male student love in Tokyo, Aika or baby love appeared in a high school in his high school magazine in Japanese. Uh, the tale takes place in Tokyo High School, similar to the one that Yi Guangsu himself attended at the time. It centers on a Korean student named Bungichi. So his, the name is uh, Japanese pronunciation is Bungichi, but his Korean pronunciation is Mungil. Um, due to its specific context, being in a school publication and in Japanese language, maybe love had a limited readership in Japan and Korea, but it was later in the 1930s discussed by Korean authors as one of the Yi Guangsu's most significant works. So further, Yi Guangsu himself recalls this story in one of his biographical essays that a portrayal of same-sex love of a boy, acknowledging the important theme of male-male love in his early writings. Uh, the plot goes as follows. Bungichi, a young Korean student, is in the stage of agony when he pays a visit to his boarding house, uh, when he uh, pays a visit to the boarding house of his Japanese classmate, Misao, to whom he has previously confessed his love. Before returning to Korea for the summer break, Bungichi wishes to Misao, wishes to see Misao one last time but it seems that Misao declined to meet with him. The story ends with Bungichi thinking that his love has been rejected, lying down on the railroad tracks in Shibuya to end his life. The story is full of reference of Bungichi's love, I, uh, for Misao, but the descriptions of Korean young man, uh, Bungichi is a lonely soul passionately seeking companionship in a world where he does not seem to belong. This paradigm continues in Yi Guangsu's another story, another story, Yun Guangho, another short story, uh, Yun Guangho from 1918, published in Korean language magazine, Chongchun, targeting, uh, Chongchun meaning youth, targeting the youth student readers. This story tells two, case, two cases of tragic love stories between a Korean student and a Japanese student in K University in Tokyo. So I'm skipping the plot line of this, um, the Yoon Gang Wo short story. So Yoon Gang Wo is the, the male uh, protagonist, the name and the title. Uh, this both the, uh, the Aika in uh, Yi Guangsu's two story, this Aika, the maybe love, and then Yoon Gang Ho, feature male-male desire of Koreans towards Jap Japanese in Japan. 
actually, so there are actually other stories, short stories that about the male male love or the friendship between Koreans. Both Bungichi and the Yungwango participate in male male love as part of their experience of student culture while being successful students in their Tokyo schools. Same sex desire and amour passion open doors for both ways. Being a part of the ongoing cultural phenomenon of the uh, this student culture, the male male love, and also being accepted by fellow Japanese men in Japanese community. However, these characters are also representations of unruly Koreans in metropole and for the Japanese elite, loving an inferior Jap uh, Korean is not yet appropriate. The colonial intimacy in Lee Gwang Su's writing at this stage thus manifest colonial unruliness, unsettled modernity, and changing perspectives of heterosexual love. Uh, so far, the intimate feelings between Koreans and Japanese were portrayed not yet in the form of heterosexual romantic love, but in the form of mixed family and male-male love. So I will move into the late 1930s. So the late 1930s, in the late 1930s, the Kumika era, we see more of novels and short stories featuring Korean Japanese romantic or conjugal relationships um, in, in, the, yeah, in the late 1930s. These literary texts were contained more directly uh, contained more direct reference contained more direct references to Japan and Korea as one body policies. Deson Ilche could be best manifested according to the government slogans and news outlets in homes where two different ethnic and cultural subjects blended their lives under the same roof. Intermarriages were meant to be a perfect example of harmonious assimilation. The shift in literature exploring the Son Yuche theme was, of course, not independent of political circumstances. In this period, a growing number of Korean elite writers, including people who in the past had shown nationalist resistance to Japan, began leaning toward collaboration with the empire at war and the participating in the promotion of military service of Koreans. Despite the fact that Lee Gwang Su published many essays that expressed his consistent support of Japanese imperialism from 1941, which is categorized his pro-Japanese activity years, um, his fiction presented more complicated and nuanced picture of assimilation. I would like to highlight the complica uh, complications involved in presenting intimate feelings and affective relationships in novels that defy a blind acceptance of assimilation policy. Some of Lee Gwang Su's novel that focused on the colonial intimacy presents the process of temporary adoption to the Japanese family. Within the sanction of family-like situation, the Korean protagonists prove to the Japanese friends that they are worthy of equal treatment. So for example, the next, uh, the uh, example, the uh, next story, the serialized novel, When Hearts Truly Meet, or Kokoro Aifrete Koso, uh, published in Ryoki, the Korean flag magazine. Uh, written in Japanese, When Hearts Truly Meet, uh, this, uh, whose intended reader may have included Japanese settlers in Korea, offers opportunities to see similarities between Japanese and Korean culture and suggests that the Koreans and Japanese who live together under the same roof will bring the communities closer. The families in this novel are privileged elites in Seoul or Keijo, and they are, um, they are respected by their communities. So the, main, the four main characters are leaders of the younger generation, who are facing the challenges of the recent war and the expansion of the Japanese empire. The story presents intermingling of the two sets of siblings. The Korean side is Kim Chung-sik and his younger sister, Seongnan, and the Japanese settler side is the Higashi Takeo uh, and his younger sister, Fumie. The four meet when medical doctor Kim Chung-sik rescues 
two Japanese hikers stranded near Seoul and take them to Kim family home for recovery. They become friends, and although Chung Sik's father is a Hutei Senjin, or a Korean who resists the Japanese rule, Takeo falls in love with Chongnan, and then while Chung Sik grows to like Fumie. The temporary adoptions in the story begin with the introduction of the two Japanese siblings to Chung Sik's home after their hiking accident. Takeo and Fumio stay within Kim's family while being cared for, and this caring gesture inspires uh, these Higashi siblings to learn about Korean domestic life. Impressed by their experience in Kim's home, the Higashi siblings invite the Kim siblings to stay overnight in their home in Keijo in return. Their long stay in each other's home functions as temporary adoptions that include various cultural experiences at home space. In this context, cross-cultural, cultural cross-dressing or the putting the, um, one of the other cultures ethnic dress placed a central role in adoption experience. During the rescue stay, Takeo finds himself wearing Chosonbok or the Korean traditional dress when he wakes up. To Takeo, this colonial cross-dressing is uncomfortable, even unpleasant, but soon he finds that he does not mind being dressed in Korean style due to the generous care of Kim family. Later, when the sibling revisits, revisits Kim, Fumie tries the Joseonbok with Seongnan and all of them finds pleasant and suitable. The overnight stay leaves a long, strong impression of kindness and deepened, uh, deepened the friendship among the four characters. So I, I wanted to give you a kind of visual reference at the time. This is kind of screen capture of the movie um, You and I from 1941, uh, directed by a um, Korean director named Ho Young. He went um, with his Japanese kind of Jap um, Japanese name, Eitaro uh, Hinatsu. Um, so you can see the, the, the left side, the two characters, the Korean characters wearing Korean, Chuzonbo Korean dress, and then right hand side, the uh, Japanese character, uh, Mitsuye is wearing the Japanese style dress. And then the, on the right hand the, um, you know, section, the, in, the, in the Korean, this is a Korean home, um, um, Korean, well, actually, Korean Japanese mixed home. Um, that the uh, the Korean uh, character Peki is trying the Japanese style dress that the uh, Mitsuye, uh, uh, this is Mitsuye's dress, then she's trying on. So, this kind of cross dressing the women wearing the other culture's dress is uh, often referenced in this intermarriage literature and also at the time the, um, the movies, a couple of different movies. And then maybe, oh, I, I should go here, okay. Uh, from the moment that Chung Sik rescued the sibling, there's a romantic tension between uh, Chung Sik and Fumie. However, without fully developing the plot line, uh, the romance between the Chung Sik and Fumie, this couple, they kind of fade away in the story. And then the center of the story is the Takeo, the Japanese character, the male character, Takeo becomes a central figure in the novel. And then Takeo's interest in uh, Songnan is very pronounced. And then he takes action against his family's will. So the father, Higashi, the, so his father has reservation about the Kims because particularly because they're regarding the Kim's family's uh, father is reputations of the Futei Senjin. Takeo's mother um, and then also worries about this Renai, she, the, the mentioned the Renai, the romantic love between Takeo and Songnan. Through Takeo's eyes, the narrative focuses on how Japanese people can acknowledge Koreans as equals. With his love for Songnan, Takeo not only becomes more understanding of the Korean style of domestic life, but also takes on a less aggressive assimilation style. Takeo realized that Kim's siblings are the same as the Japanese. And then this rhetoric the, uh, in the novel that it's really directly comes from the Deson Yuche slogan. Um, the interpretation of the government policy on this personal level must mobilize emotion and affect. 
Takio tells Fumie, I didn't care for affect before, but now I think what moves people is affect. This is not any emotion that psychology scientifically categorized, but everyday human affect. I believe the Naisen Itai or the Desen Ite is the same way. If the mainlanders, that means Japanese, and the Koreans are not connected with affect, the relationship is not real. Takio's assertion illustrates how a policy like Naisen Itai can be sentimentalized and romanticized on the individual level, making the imperial assimilation policy into a source of emotional connection between Koreans and Japanese. Takio presents everyday human affect or human emotion is the source of the Korean connect Koreans connection to Japanese, and it is what makes them equal to Japanese imperial citizens. Narratives that present Japanese imperialism from the Japanese settlers' perspectives are rare in colonial novels. In Iwangsu's writing, the Koreans and Japanese settlers become a single effective community that shares the imperial ideology, and Takeo becomes the champion of the love and affect that can make the Japanese accept Koreans as equals. Um, Iwangsu presents the possibility of effective community a community that shares love and support for each other at the time of the total war. When hearts truly meet and the other stories by Lee Gwang Su frames Korean Japanese romance and intermarriage in a form of family, community, and the empire. Also to be noted is that despite the fact that uh, his stories carry supportive tone of Japanese empire, Assimilation and intermarriage are difficult tasks that requires elitist perspective of full-fledged conversion with true heart. So I, because I think I'm kind of slow in, um, so I want to briefly introduce the Yosok to give another contrast, another layer of the intermarriage stories. The, also, this writer is the so final example is the uh, of the fiction of the colonial intimacy is from the writer Yosok. Um, Yosok is that um, his publication period overlaps with the Igangsu, the previous examples, uh, but then they actually have different backgrounds. So Yosok is younger than Igangsu, and then he grew up already colonized nation. So he's, uh, Yosok's education was entirely in Korea, but in Japanese language schools. And then he went to Keijo Imperial University. So maybe because of his own colonial experience, Yosok's perspective on assimilation and intermarriage was more flexible and casual, I would say. And, um, and by being flexible, Yosok practices um, what I, call reverse, reverse imperialism. So I don't have time to go um, so much detail about this, but then um, with the this example, the Azamino show that was published in 1941, this is a story about a couple in, uh, in Keijo, the Seoul. Uh, Han is um, a writer and then um, magazine writer and editor. So another elite Korean who's fluent in Japanese and he has a wife, he calls a wife, Asami, and they live together in urban, urban um, Seoul in apartment. So kind of everything's modernized and they visit to the cafes, department store, hotels, parks. Um, uh, the old examples in the story is kind of urban modern setting with his Japanese wife who's working, who used to work in a bar or cafe in Seoul. So she's part of that kind of the Japanese woman who worked in the entertainment section. Um, but this story that, um, um, what is different from the Yi Gwangsu is that while Yi Gwangsu kind of emphasizes the full-fledged force kind of like effort for Koreans to assimilate into Japanese family and Japanese culture, then the Japanese will acknowledge that Koreans will be equal at Japan. But then Iga, Iyo Sok's, the uh, this story is more like the Japanese woman can be adapted to Korean culture very fast and very flexible. And Korean men are already very um, 
uh, uh, very fluent in Japanese culture and language, they don't really need to have need to put full effort, effort in assimilation anymore. So there's a different kind of combination of this um, assimilation and different perspective of assimilation and the intermarriage. So I just I want to read the, this one paragraph uh, that I prepared. So in the book that I argue um, that this, this uh, Azamino show, the, the story of Tiso, and then the other novel, Green Tower by Yosef, that they, um, I argue that the intermarriage union and the Koreanization of the female Japanese partners show the flexibility of Koreanness. This flexibility comes from Iosok's idea of universal humanity that transcends ethnicities and races. Intentionally or unintentionally, Iosok highlights transgressing bodies and challenges conventional and fixed notion of race, gender, and class, and thus produces the possibility of disrupting the colonial order. This is the paradox of assimilation the easy transformation of colonized subjects into beings equals to the members of the colonizing race leads to the collapse of the colonial and racial hierarchy. So conclusion, final paragraph. Um, the, my presentation on colonial period Korean literature demonstrates perhaps an unexpected side effect of writing about intimate relationship with colonizers. Literature that portrays Korean Japanese intimacy, sex, romance, and marriage and kinship inevitably highlights the anxieties of Korean men and about race, gender, and sexuality under the Japanese colonial social order. Stories presented today reveal that when imagined romance with Japanese, uh, Japanese Korean authors had to question their own positions in Japanese empire, and more importantly, they had to define their own perception of gender, race, family, and community. Therefore, this romance literature shed a new light on the colonial male elite's desire to rise in the imperial hierarchy and to claim their agency within Japanese and global imperialism. Um, so the last the image that I kind of wanted to put uh, is this. One is the cover image of the January 1st, uh, January 1945 issue of the uh, Naisen Itai, which was a magazine, um, a Japanese language magazine produced by Koreans and the Japanese settlers in, in Korea. Uh, the cover image, you can see that the Japanese, this one has the Japanese boy and then Korean girl sitting next to each other. So of course there's a gender dimension and then because they are children, right? But then they're like sort of very familiar gays looking at each other. And then there's a Korean changseng, this is like totem figure, but then also they're like watching them over with this kind of, they're, they're the symbol of the safety. So that you can see that the traditional kind of ideology guarding them, this younger generation of the future. And then this is a, but the wildest co magazine cover looks a little bit uh, um, simple, but then there's a, at the same time, there were this very elaborate magazines. This is actually Moda Neon is from Japan, but you can see the color of like how the this, uh, uh, Korean um, gaze, the, the colonial gaze to Korean women at the time, that's the park. This is uh, kind of similar to the scene that in the, uh, the story of Tissel where Asami, um, uh, walks in the palace park um, that with her husband and the wearing Korean dress. And then, so that sort of shows that atmosphere of that time that the walking in this palace around the palace and the, uh, the public park in this kind of Korean dress represents Korean bourgeoisie uh, femininity. So that, that's kind of image um, that I wanted to share with you. Thank you for listening, and I, I look forward to listening to your questions and comments. Thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, uh, for a really fascinating talk. Anets, for uh, questions, um, which you guys could uh, either raise your hand to ask. Uh, I'm going to have Kim first, but you could also uh, send questions on chat.
uh, if you feel more comfortable and we'll try to navigate that. So Kim, please go ahead. Hi, Suyan, it's so nice to see you. Um, Hi. <laughs> Um, I really enjoyed your book. It was um, so enjoyable and oh, just really enjoyable. I'm looking forward to using it in class. Um, I thought I would just ask a question that I had while reading the book actually. And just um, because I myself am working on a, a, a similar period and I have questions of my own, but I found um, in particular your use of intimacy in this context really compelling, especially because it's uh, an imperial context. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you understand the relationship um, between different effective structures? Um, so in many of your close readings, I found that those two, the things like intimate feelings and romantic desire were often used interchangeably. Um, so intimacy was often used to describe the figuration of, for, I think you use the domestic home, the racial assimilation through adoption um, and romantic desire actually featured much less prominently than I expected. And you have these also really interesting readings, um, uh, shorter readings on dress and blood, which suggests that intimacy has to do a lot with the body, skin. Um, so yes, can you talk a little bit more about your theorization of affective structures of intimacy and romance? And also in relation to this question, what is your understanding of the softness of romance and intimacy in relation to the violence of racial assimilation? So like how scholars have talked about um, disciplining uh, the Korean body, the corporal uh, punishment and um, during this period. So um, yes, <laughs> I think that's two questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for, um, these very two challenging questions, actually. Um, so I um, okay. First, uh, the first one. I think this intimacy is is still a struggle for me. I think I try to use the intimacy as a um, kind of broader concept that can really include everything from friendship to community, um, closeness, and um, kind of like family adoption. Not only just the family. Um, your like a uh, close related or like a really blood related family but then the adoption um and the um yeah so extended family in the community um but then how do you how do you navigate how do you put romantic desire or romantic relationship with that um i would i would like to um i think i kind of thought the, the romantic relationship will be like under like one category of the colonial intimacy of the intimacy because the it can be I mean I think the um, other scholars use intimacy in very very different ways so I kind of I try to structure my uh, thoughts under the colonial intimacy but then obviously when I use the romantic when I look at the romantic relationship or even the definition of the marriage or the cohabitation is such a complicated um, term I mean like historically or uh, the anthropologically the marriage or cohabitation sexual arrangement is so diverse so I had to like really um, think about different ways of relationship so I think I don't have a, a like a clear cut answer, but then throughout the writing the book, I think my perception of the intimacy have changed. My perception of the marriage have changed as I kind of um, read through the and uh, do more analysis. And so I think maybe there's a mix. I think earlier writing maybe kind of has my uh, sim more simplistic idea of marriage, defining marriage and romance. But then later I kind of like try to unpack it more and the, but then, you know, like writing is like you revise and go back and forth and the different chapters have a little bit the, this like traces of my earlier, um, or earlier thoughts. So um, effective structures, I think because it's, uh, it's really challenging because different scholars use them very differently. Uh, so I think I just had to, in the book, I just define color by colonial intimacy. I mean this, like the, you know, the, in this way, I, I want to include uh, kinship, family, um, close community relationship, all under the intimacy. And then 
but then um, a lot of also, I think the challenging part is the, uh, the literature, um, actually very few of them really deals with the romantic relationship, but the more of them deals with the family relationship or pseudo family relationship, um, the community closeness, I would say. So, so I think that's why I wanted to include everything in this my in my book, and then also um, I didn't talk about the film so much here. But then in the I found the in the literature when they're focused more kind of uh, heterosexual uh, couplings, but then in the film representation, I think there's more of less of the heterosexual coupling, but the more of community of affect. Of, I would say community of affect, but this term, I think some reviewers really didn't like it actually. So the uh, more kind of um, uh, diverse community coming together, racially diverse or uh, community, linguistically diverse community coming together in the filming representation. So um, there's, a, a, there's a different kind of tendency here, but Anyway, so I don't have a really good answer for this, but this is kind of, yeah, this is the issue I think everyone should struggle and then we should like question ourselves that how we use it. Um, second question, softness of romance of, in the, this kind of violation of violent history um, that together. Um, I think this issue for the colonial studies in Korea, I think this is one of the issues that um, uh, there's a less studies on the intimacy, looking at the intimacy, because we are all automatically kind of, we automatically think the viol, uh, colonial violence and the colonialization and the imperialism has this certain violence. Um, and then we're all aware of that. And then, so we kind of don't um, uh, tend to study less about this intimate or the soft kind of romantic relationships. Um, in that it's 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 a coexist, but then it's like it's a coexisting. They they exist at the same same time, so we cannot really you know um, ignore one part of the other. Um, are they closely related? Uh, I think that's another question. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think I have a good answer for this. This is really really a kind of big question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Um, I have I have a quick one. Oh, sorry. I'll I'll be very quick and then Maria. Okay. Um, how were like, and this is just uh, will ex expose my my uh, my ignorance and lack of knowledge of uh, of uh, modern Korean history and Japanese imperial history. But I'm I'm curious. I guess to Kim's second question. Um, how were these writers um, received after 1945? So was there any kind of judgment passed on them as collaborators or as promoters of this particular type of intimacy in independent Korea? So that's that's my question. Yeah, yes, definitely, definitely. Because uh, the Yin Jik uh, is actually, he was a translator of the guy who sold <laughs> like a, sold the, like uh, the kings whatever uh, the the stamp to uh, approve the annexation so basically he's like uh, the target of the, the national hate <laughs> uh, so Yin Jik, but at the same time it's a comp uh, complex history but the Yin Jik, the the first writer I discusses is that he had a really great role in the Japanese annexation um, of Korea but at the same time that he what he is like uh, one of the very, very important uh, modern Korean literature writer that really wrote uh, lots of um, this um, several important uh, was a prolific writer. And then he also wrote the several important um, new new fiction, new novel, genre, Shin uh, pieces. So he's very important figure, but at the same time that he's like really uh, on the list of the collaborator the, of the Japanese um, with the Japanese empire. And then also Yi Gwangsu is the uh, also considered father of the Korean literature, but at the same time, he's also co considered collaborator. Uh, so the, some examples that I use in the book and then also writing uh, that I discuss is that until 90s, like uh, uh, part of his, 
writings that he wrote in Japanese or that the pieces that are considered as pro-Japan was totally ignored in the scholarship. So you don't really, you know it's there, but then you don't really study them. Um, so, but the, from the 90s, you know, people actively translate that, you know, to Korean from Japanese text to Korean, so more public can read it, but then more, uh, more students can read it, and then you, you kind of discuss it, but then, yeah, so there's a stigma if you um, um, kind of work on this work, which, which considered as a pro Japan, then you're not working on something important, right? So, um, so there's, a, after 1945, of course, there's a conflict so, you know, there's the like, people are still on the list of the collaborator uh, there. They, they publish the scholars, academic scholar historians publish books on the, the list of the names of collaborators. And then they're still there. But but at the same time that, you know, it's not um, particularly Iguang's work. You cannot really um, there's a collaboration period, but then you cannot um, read all of his writing as just a collaboration. So that's why I kind of, I read this, um, the novels um, as an example that it has more complex nuance and then there's this struggle of how to accept assimilation, how to put Koreans within the Japanese empire, struggles about the hierarchy, racial hierarchy um, and the position of the Korean. So. I would, yeah. So that's the, I think that's the uh, the state of the Korean, excuse me, Korean um, history and the Korean scholarship that's always has this other side and then always the burden of, of that uh, you're actually discussing somebody who's uh, labeled as collaborator, but at the same time that you wanted to give more nuanced picture. It's not a simple black and white history. Yes, that's, yeah, I would stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, Maria actually asked me to read Marianne's questions first, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> so Marianne is asking, colleague Marianne Tarkov is asking, in Japan in the early 20th century, there was a discourse of romantic love, and I, um, I'm, I'm reading it in Chinese, of course, as being modern and westernized, as opposed to koi or passion, which was seen as pre-modern uh, Japanese. I wonder if modern romantic love was implicated as a kind of colonial technology in Japanese imperialism. Was there a similar discourse around Renai or romantic love in Korea at the time? Great question. Yes, um, so this is, um, other scholars have written in Korean literature about the Renai, so the import of the Renai from Japanese literature and the circulation of the, the word uh, Renai in the Yone, so the same, uh, same kanji. Um, and then how uh, how they are circulated in Korea. So um, the Renai, it's pretty similar. The discourse of the Renai in the in Japan was um, the books, uh, canonical books in Japan, uh, Japanese Renai was read in uh, by the Korean authors who studied in Japan and then who learned Japanese. And they're also Korean readers. Korean Korea in the colonial Korea was like one of the biggest Japanese language book market. So the circulation of the newspaper, magazines, and the books were um, tremendous. Uh, it was the Japanese biggest market. So yeah, so the pretty much you can see the night from the 1920s, so, uh, I guess, um, and uh, that's the more simple answer, more nuanced answer is there's a different period of the using of the Renai um, Romantic Love in the 1920s and 1930s, how they are introduced are slightly different and then how they're uh, used in the novels are slightly different. So for example, the 19, uh, 1917, the Heartless, the Bujang, the Korean, uh, the Yi Gwangsu's novel, that's kind of a uh, thought as kind of canonical first major introduction of the Renai um, the, in the, the younger younger generation, young characters of love triangle and the love stories um, using similar pattern of the Japanese literature. So that's, that appears in 1917, but then if you really look at closely that the, um, the Renai, the practice of the Renai is actually less um, less portion, less in the novel. Um, so it's more of the goal oriented, I would say. So, but then from the 1920s, there's more stories about really um, um, development of the Rena in the 1920s. So I was, yeah. So the, 
uh, there's a different layers, but the 1920s and 1930s in Korea has adopted um, Japanese style renai. And then, okay, so is there the other person? Maria? Oh. Hi, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. I learned a lot. Uh, so my question is, 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 is meant to actually like help my students, many of whom are in the audience, uh, think about your lecture in relation to our course. Um, so this semester I'm teaching a, a class, uh, a course on uh, feminisms in Asia, and I've assigned a book by Laura Kang, Traffic in Asian Women, and we discussed the comfort women uh, issue and the comfort system. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how we might be able to think of this intermarriage as a form of colonial intimacy to kind of like really violent sort of like, like colonial intimacy as well in the form of, of the comfort system. Okay. Um, yes, that's, this is, this is also um, a tough question. So I also teach you know, like the courses on the, um, when I do the family and gender in Korea, I teach on the comfort woman um, to show that the, yeah, it's a different side of the, or or many, many faces of the colonial intimacy, right? Um, the, the system, I think there are different layers. I think of the comfort woman system, um, trying to look at the um, colonial intimacy is the one, one way, I guess, okay, so one way to look at it is the comfort woman system is really trying to mobilize and utilize uh, the Korean woman as the consumption and then the kind of the, the subject that the object uh, object that the Japanese military men can consume, right? Um, so in that way, there's a, this, this imperial hierarchy Right, the imperial colonizers can utilize women's body, colonized women's body in their own purpose. So I think there's, there's that kind of dimension. Um, the colonial intimacy, um, on the other hand, in the Korea for the literature part, what I can say is that when the Japanese government, colonial government, rolled out the idea of the desanuche and the intermarriage, they promoted the, the intermarriage marriage um probably with the idea of this marriage between korean and japanese they didn't really um indicate the gender like uh, the japanese man and the korean woman get married but then when they rolled out this kind of promotion the korean man took it as oh so the korean man can marry japanese woman um so and then we we're going to like think about this like we're going to use Japanese women in these writings. Um, so the, the intermarriage kind of this or the romance writings act there, only the Korean writers really actively wrote about it. Um, so not the Japanese writers. So within the, in Korea. So I think that when you become the who's the agency, uh, who's, the, who's the, um, the writer, who's the authority, if it's a Korean male, they immediately kind of write about Japanese women, subjectizing Japanese women. Um, and then, you know, like trying to configure um, their own position within the Japanese empire. But the comfort woman system, I think, because it's coming from the Japanese military and Japanese uh, government in the metropole, more like the metropole system, um, Japanese Empire, then you can you kind of utilize the other sides, female bodies, right? So um, it's 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 different dimensions. I don't know. It, it's I cannot really say you know like these two two different. They're they're two completely different things. They're really connected in the thinking about the gender and the sex and the intimacy. Um, but then I, I don't want to say that, you know, like at the same time, like, you know, they're the same thing. So it's, uh, it's completely questions. I don't have a clear answer right now, but um, I think this is, a, this is a question. What I usually in the course I try to do is like one week I talk about this colony intimacy about the writers, Korean men, you know, imagining Japanese female bodies. But then the other week, the next week, I also the, um, taught up, uh, teach about the comfort woman system, which is like the really violence against the woman's body. Um, so 
so this this is like there's a contrast definitely but um yeah i that's yeah that's how i would how i would like to approach thank you that's great um anyone else <clears throat> I don't see any more questions in the chat. Maria, are there? Emma's raising her hand, Emma Wing. Oh, Emma, sorry, I, I, I thought you were clapping. Oh, was she clapping? <laughs> sorry. Emma, do you oh, have a question? she was clapping, sorry. Okay. So <laughs> Edna, Edna has a question. Uh, hi, Professor Ken, thank you for your um, amazing lecture. I was just wondering if um, Korean writers also wrote about other kinds of like intimacy. So, for example, we just in my another class we read um, some Chinese intellectuals were writing about me, um, Chinese men marrying to white women as like to create this new Eurasian race. Um, and I was wondering if there were similar things going on, not just within. Um, Japan and Korea, but also maybe globally. Yes, that's a that's a great uh, great question. So I can mention the chapter that I didn't really mention <laughs> in the talk. So one of the chapter I kind of looked at is the magazine articles. So, so I didn't really find so many writings, uh, the novels or short stories, but the Eosok, the writer that I talked about, the last one, Eosok is really a kind of special, strange person. So he wrote, <laughs> he has a novel that a Korean character traveled to Manchuria and then meet a Russian woman and then the brings her as her bride, uh, his bride. Um, and of course, they he speaks fluent Russian in the writings. And then of course, the he says like this Russian woman looks exactly like Korean. It's like, it's like flipping the hand, we all look alike and then we can speak the universal language and then there's no problem. Uh, and then he has another like unpublished uh, manuscript that also has this Russian woman character from Manchuria um, um, that you know, comes to Korea and then marry a Korean guy. Um, but then, so yeah, yeah. so Korean era, like I, we don't have so many um, other examples. Um, there could be somebody, someone, something that I haven't found yet, but then I think I pretty much looked everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, but then magazine articles, and there was a famous cases of like a uh, American, white American lady um, who married a Korean guy and they lives in Korea, Davis. I think her name was Davis because they met in New York while he was studying and he came back and then she followed, followed him. Um, and then they live in Korea. So there, that's the famous case that newspaper interviewed her and then the husband couple in the several times and she realized that in the 1930s and then other like women's magazine also interviewed them. So the one women's magazine that I looked at in the night from the published in the night, late 1930s and they kind of serialized all these foreigner couples, so, so they call it the international marriage. So it's not, when you say kukje or when you say international, it's not Japanese. So it's a Koreans and non-Japanese otherness. So one case is Chinese woman, and then one case was German woman. Um, another one was like American, or I think the, and the other case was a husband was Canadian. Um, so Korean woman and the Canadian guy who was in the Northern Korea mining company, um, mining area. So they're, they kind of, but then they, these magazines, home visit um, kind of articles, they really, um, the writer really exploited the fact that like they have uh, blue eyed children, uh, the children looks, this Eurasian looking children so pretty, or, you know, the house have piano and it's a Western building. Um, but then in the, in kind of reading between the lines that you can see their marriage were not perfect. This was like one German woman is actually a second wife. He, the guy who studied in Germany and then they got married and she came to Korea and then found out he was already married and he has some children. So he built a second house next to each other. So she lives in the, uh, the second house and then, um, so the interviewer was quite, um, the writer was a bit cruel, but then she's, uh, the, the writer says like this German, this woman is already old, like 
30, 35 years old is so old, but she's pregnant because she's desperate to have this kind of her footing in this family. So um, yeah, so things like that. So it's not really always perfect picture if you read between the lines, but then they kind of sens sensationalize this international marriage and then always played out this kind of American or Western character um, in the series. So yeah, that's, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. You and y Yuri had a question as well for our last question of the day. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Um, I will try to keep it short. It was an amazing talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I really enjoyed and learned so much. And I don't have a, a well-formulated question, but I guess I wanted to ask um, uh, your thoughts about the temporality that is, uh, I guess, hinted at many of the stories you talked about. And I guess I was thinking about the temporality of settlement, I guess, from the settler colonial Japanese families being in, in Korea and uh, your examples of some of the texts talked about the temporary adoption or like the cross dressing. It's a kind of a, not a permanent, but temporary switching of the roles or clothes, but then the, the empire building the settler colonial empire aims for permanence right like I guess so I was curious um, if you had any uh, more insight into this kind of futurity that is implied by family reproduction heteronormative domesticity that is always building the future and it's a settler a future but here you're highlighting some kind of dissonance or maybe it's not so linear this I guess the the imperial futurity and, and I wonder if you can say a bit more about the settlement and the kind of temporal domesticity uh, relations, if that makes any sense. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I haven't really thought about this. Um, so I actually, I don't think I have answer for you right now how to connect this temporality issue with the settlement issue, but I think you're right um, that the, when the colonial settlement um, or the colonialization, they really thought this will be permanent. And the Iguangsu, the writers, and then uh, many um, elite thinkers, they turned to in the 1930s, late 1930s, uh, um, even though they were before more Korean independent nationalistic, they turned to more collaboration and then more for the Japanese empire in the 19. Uh, late 1930s because they thought really it was going to be permanent right the Japanese emperor is going to be permanent settler will be uh or is going to be permanent in Korea um so the future I yes the question of futurity I think is very important um at the same time the you know the Yuan famously wrote like the the uh well, national reconstruction that he says like oh Korean can develop we will assimilate to Japanese but then it'll take 50 or 100 years. Um, so there's a kind of idea that they thought that this Japanese empire will be forever, but then Korean assimilation or Korean turning into Japan, completely Japanese will take like 100 years. Um, so I think there's always this kind of uh, conflicting ideas of the, um, the permanent, but yet it's, it's not there. But it's, I think we can also think about the um, imperialism and assimilation that's always that uh, telling the, the colonized people that you can be you can become like us, but then you're not there yet, right? So there's always delayed sense of time. Um, uh, so that yeah, it's the same that, that you're your thinking is going to be permanent, the empire will be permanent, but at the same time, the becoming the imperial subject is always delayed. You're always one step behind of the the the, uh, the mainland people. So um, so that's one idea. The settlement, um, um, Japanese settlement. I don't know if you're thinking about the uh, if you're asking me about the the settlement. Um, there their position, the, the Japanese settlers' position about the, the empire and the, the relationship? I, I, I didn't think through that much. It was more like okay. I was kind of uh, responding to, to your uh, use of the term settlers and yes. how they are kind of temporarily being adapted into Korean families or the opposite, the, you know, the kind of temporal assimilation right. happening on both ways. And yet the framework is 
exactly what you said. There's two kinds of futility. One is that that um, not yet, but will be uh, right. assimilated. And yeah, so I, I just was really fascinated by, um, yeah, you, the way you complicated uh, the kind right. of the yes. vision of the empire. Thank you. So I think that uh, the when I think about Japanese settlers, I think I'm kind of influenced by the kind of the uh, previous uh, studies about the colonial Japanese colonial settlers, who who some of them were actually um, promoting that better treatment of Koreans, and then they were actually uh, saying that Koreans have like this all these qualities of assimilation already, so we need to treat them better because particularly because they are already in, Japan, in in Korea. So they they want to have like safe environment. Um, they didn't want to antagonize Koreans. And then that one hand, and then, but then I don't, I didn't really talk about this in the talk, but then um, one, one way to uh, think about is the Japanese settlers daughters who were uh, born or who were mostly raised in colonial Korea, they had a pretty low standing in the empire, because if you, even if you're a Japanese woman, if you're raised in Korea, you're already tainted. And then for your marriage prospect, um, you know, they think like, oh, you can only marry Korean men or like you cannot really go back to the mainland or to save you from this, you know, savage land. We need to send you to mainland and then like your uncle will arrange you marry uh, Jap proper Japanese men. So the um, the the settler women um, and the Japanese settler women, or in particular the daughters or the second generation, have different standings also. So I think that's a that's a very tricky questions. But the temporality, yes, I don't. Yeah, I don't think I can explain it so much here. <laughs> that's okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, I'm gonna read the last question from the chat by Ming Kuo. Um, uh, they're asking. My question is say that the contemporary widespread fetishization and idealization of Japanese women as the ideal female and an, an, and an anti-feminist feminine figure in South Korea, is that a continuation from the colonialist subjectification of Japanese women? Mm. Hmm. I I I'm always like reluctant to say anything contemporary is like really continuation from the colonial era because Korean history there are like so many ups and downs. Uh, and then there's um I think even thinking about the intermarriage between Koreans and Japanese uh, Koreans and Japan right now in the intermarriage is tainted by um, the Cold War experience of Korean women being sex workers or um, entertainment kind of camp town women who's marrying white U.S. military men. So any uh, international marriage is like becoming like shameful for the South Korean nationalistic perspective. So I I don't want to say like you know this is like a, the, there's a the continuation of uncut continuation from the colonial era of Japanese woman fetishization. But um, I think any kind of the contemporary time, like there's always the other, uh, like a fetishization of the other um, country's women, right? Um, so um, yeah, that I think is in more in line of uh, stereotyping uh, different country, different race, and then particularly more to these like a submissiveness of the women from the other countries. Thank you for the questions. Well, that's uh, our last question for today. Sorry, Dr. Gabili had to uh, leave. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Kim, for such a fascinating talk. And thank you for joining us from Hong Kong uh, late at night. Um, I just want to flag our next event, which is going to be on April 7th. Um, here it is, our next speaker, uh, which we hope um, to, to, to do in person will be by Dr. Clara Iwas uh, Iwasaki. So that's on uh, April 7th at 4 p.m. And we'll um, share more information closer to the date. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, at such early time at 9 a.m. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Um, Kim. Have a good day and have a good night and uh, take care everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly, we need to talk later. <laughs> bye. Emma, can you stop the recording, please? It's so nice to see you. How are you?